Hello everyone and welcome to video number two in which we're going to learn about mass extinctions. So let's jump right in. So the idea that there is more structure to extinction than a random process um, that just happens in a, in a time averaged way has bubbled along since the work of Georges Cuvier. We have been able to actually look at the patterns far better in race, recent years as our picture of the fossil record has grown ever more complete. One of the key names in this area is a gentleman called Jack Sepkowski. So he's a key name behind the study of diversity in deep time. And he created graphs, such as the one shown here, that show global history of diversity through successful, successive intervals of geological time. He counted, for example, the number of families present at each time period, or the number of genera, the genuses that were around at different times. And in doing so, he showed robustly, amongst other things, that there seem to be periods of pulsed extinctions. So if we take one of his family level Sepkowski curves, because that's what these things are called, and we see that the higher we are on the y-axis, the more families we have as we go through time from the Cambrian to today, we see dips, one there, one there, one there, one there, and one there. And these are pulses of extinction. Despite uncertainties in the dates of our fossil taxa and a multitude of biases which we know exist in the fossil record, approaches such as this one give a very consistent picture um, that we have pulses of extinction events. And this is a true across the databases that we use, not just Sepkowski's early work that I've put on this particular slide here. And this has allowed us to identify that these pulses occur at specific periods, and we have coined the term for these mass extinctions. Exactly how we define a mass extinction can vary. Basically, long story short, every mass extinction is different. Um, no single event is identical. I've given you one definition on this slide here from um, a, a dictionary of environmental conversation. Conservation, not conversation, that's a whole different thing. This definition is a catastrophic or widespread event in which a large proportion, up to 90% of species, become extinct in a relatively short time compared with normal background extinction. Um, that's just one and probably fairly flawed definition because no definition happily fits all mass extinctions. So we can, we can expand on that definition just a little bit and we can start creating definitions based on what mass extinctions um, have in common. So the common factors we would identify and what we would probably call mass extinctions include many species become extinct, perhaps more than 30% of plants and animals die at the same time. The extinct organisms span a broad range of ecologies and typically include marine and non-marine forms, plants and animals, microscopic and large forms. So basically this is a, um, a process that seems to be independent of particular um, groups of organisms. Extinctions should be, if they are mass extinctions, worldwide covering most continents and ocean basins. Extinctions should, in a mass extinction event, all happen within a relatively short period of time and hence they will typically be related to a single cause or cluster of interlinked causes such as a um, bolide impact shown as um, represented by this movie poster from Armageddon on the left hand side here. If you don't have Bruce Willis to save the earth, um, a large impactor is significantly problematic. The level of extinction we see in a mass extinction event should stand out as consistently higher or considerably higher, sorry I should say, than the background extinction level. It's hard to be more precise than that because as I mentioned each mass extinction is unique but also because it's sometimes hard to pin down exactly the timing and the scale of the events that occurred in a mass extinction in the past. We're working off a fragmented fossil record, which makes studying these extinctions sometimes a little bit hard. As you can see from this lovely diagram, which I really like on the right hand side here, that there are actually this gradation of different levels of extinction. And there are minor extinctions that typically coincide with the um, boundaries between our geological time periods. And you may want to have a quick think about why that may be the case. 
So the advent of computers has allowed large databases to be created. Um, and for each species in these databases, which um, capture some of the diversity of the fossil record, we can, for example, list the first and last appearance of each species and do this on a really big scale. In many modern computer-based studies, we then choose to diagnose extinctions through the percentage of taxa that go extinct between time intervals or time bins in our analysis. And these extinctions are shown on this diagram here. So between any two time bins, if a large proportion of animals go extinct, or animals, I should say, organisms more generally, if species go extinct between two time intervals, we get a peak on this graph. And you can see that our five big mass extinctions are marked with arrows here. There are some other periods where we have high percentage losses, such as in the Cambrian, but do remember that in the Cambrian, we have a smaller number of species. So we can't say anything really about the absolute scale of these. These are large percentages of a relatively small number of species, hence them looking quite high. On the basis of studies such as this, looking at um, extinction across the fossil record with computer-based analyses, um, we can suggest that well, A, it's difficult to study mass extinct extinctions in the Precambrian before animals are around and um, complex eukaryotes on land, which came a little bit later. Um, it's a bit difficult to spot these. And it's been suggested that there may have been a Neoproterozoic extinction event that occurred between the Ediacaran fauna, um, which covered in the Milestones website, and our early Cambrian um, species. These... Uh, studies then go on to tell us that there are these five periods where we have peaks in extinction which we call the big five mass extinctions so those big five mass extinctions occurred at the end of the order vision period the end of the devonian the end of the permian period and this is the biggest of them all and we'll cover this uh, later at the end of the triassic period and the most famous one i suppose that led to the death of the non-avian dinosaurs occurred at the end of the cretaceous period um, and we'll talk about those in one of the later videos on this site. Of these, as you can see, the late Devonian and the late Triassic look a tiny bit different. And these ones seem to have lasted for quite a long period of time. And it could be, we think, that these involved lower rates of speciation rather than higher rates of extinction, necessarily. Um, so we don't see really these massive peaks here for those big five. We just get less species appearing and therefore um, ultimately uh, the diversity on planet Earth goes down across these time periods. So those are still members of the five mass extinctions. So just bear that in mind that those two are a bit different. Because of the complexity of these events, it's useful to think about them in terms of um, basically breaking down this complex situation in terms of slightly um, more fragmented um, mechanisms that may be at play. This makes us these complex things easier to understand. And we can call, break these events down into proximal kill mechanisms and ultimate kill mechanisms. It's just one way we can put things into boxes to better understand the, the complex world out there. Proximal kill mechanisms we can think of as those which actually kill the organisms in question. Okay, so that uh, I will give you some examples of in the next slide. We can then um, separate those from the ultimate kill me mechanisms. These are the things that are driving the, uh, the actual extinction, which are probably not the things that are actually killing the animals. So you can think about this as if a asteroid hits the Earth, relatively limited portion of the things that go extinct will do so because they were actually hit by an asteroid, right? But actually, the climatic change that drives is the thing that ult that will kill them. And so our ultimate kill mechanism is our impactor, and our proximal one is the um, the actual changes to the climate of Earth that that drives. I find a useful way to remember this is the movie Scream. I don't know if anyone's seen this. It's now I suppose released quite a long time ago, but this is a really nice um, way of thinking about these things in that it's a movie where um, one or perhaps many killers, I won't spoil it for you, um, kill a bunch of teenagers and they do so because of the effect of horror movies on society. So within this franchise, within this particular movie, the proximal kill mechanism is the stabbing and the knife of these killers. 
but the ultimate kill mechanism at play there is actually horror movies and their effect on society. So I find that a really useful way to remember the difference between the two. Possibly that's because I saw the um, screen movies when I was younger, probably too young to be watching these movies in all honesty, um, and so it stuck with me for a long time. But however you remember it, just try and remember that we have these proximal kill mechanisms and ultimate ones. Two primary proximal killers, proximal kill methods, um, that have been implicated in most mass extinctions are first, marine anoxia. So that is a lack of oxygen in the oceans. A modern example of this is shown on the left hand side here. This is the 2017 Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone, an 8,000 square, square mile sorry, um, zone of low oxygen, which was the largest ever recorded at that time in the Gulf, that was caused by runoff of fertilizers from the US. That in turn fueled large algal blooms that then um, ultimately would die, sink, decompose, and deplete the water of oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico, causing the extinction of lots of organisms there. So that's a modern example of marine anoxia, but this is the same mechanism that we think led to the deaths of many organisms in many of our major and quite a few of the minor extinctions in the fossil record. The second really um, primary kill mechanism that we see in most extinctions is global warming and or cooling. So basically climate change and the effects associated with that. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think a nice example of this actually is Blade Runner 2049. Clearly, aridification has occurred by 2049 in this dystopian sci-fi movie, and that will be the result of global climatic change. Um, and we know this process of aridification has happened in the past as well. So those are our two primary prox proximal kill mechanisms, anoxia and climatic change. Other proximal killers, which we think probably play a part in some extinctions, include ocean acidification, our ocean is becoming more acidic, acid rain, our rain becoming more acidic, and ozone damage associated with that. That ozone damage can lead to increased UV radiation. That's probably bad for things living in, especially in terrestrial land-based environments. Um, other uh, Proximal kill mechanisms include volcanic darkness, if you've got lots and lots of eruptions happening, cooling and photo photosynthetic shutdown associated with that volcanic darkness. And those processes that I've just mentioned have all been implicated in numerous events in the geological column. We've known about all of these proximal kill mechanisms for decades. And more recently, I would identify a trend based in the literature that I see um, looking um, doing analytical work on the chemistry of rocks especially around um, mass extinction events and these have identified other proximal mechanisms that are increasingly important we believe um, in some of these events and those include toxic metal poisoning and the biological effects of those toxic metals on animals most post silurian um, biocrises affect both terrestrial and marine biospheres. So that does, no matter what, suggest that there is, there are atmospheric processes um, at play driving global extinctions since that period. If it was only happening in one or the other of those, marine or terrestrial, then it wouldn't necessarily be an atmospheric thing. So we know these kill mechanisms. However, the well, we've got this nice handle on proximal kill mechanism in the fossil record. We've got a relatively more limited one on the ultimate kill mechanisms. Those are far harder to tie down. Why, I hear you ask. I think that is represented well by this graph. So what we can do when we're looking at the fossil record is identify um, proximal kill mechanisms that coincide with these mass extinction events. However, we then need to tie those to the ultimate kill mechanisms. And the problem we have doing so is that correlation, that two things are correlated in timing, doesn't always imply that one causes the other. That right there is represented by this graph, okay? So this is a graph that shows a, there is a statistically significant 
um, relationship between the number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool in the United States of America in any given year since 1999 to 2009 with the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in. Okay, so we have no reason to think that this thing here, the number of films Nicolas Cage has appeared in, has any causative mechanism that causes people to drown by falling into a pool. Okay, that's one example. We could do this with lots and lots of things. This is the, in red, the number of letters in the winning uh, Scripps National Spelling Bee relative to the number of people killed by venomous spiders. So again, there is no causative mechanism between these two things. And that is what I mean when I say that correlation does not equal causation. Just because two things are correlated doesn't mean that one causes the other. In order to understand if two, one causes the other, we need to know about the mechanism that links the two, okay? And in the fossil record, very often, we have a real problem linking the possible ultimate kill mechanisms with the proximal ones. We can say they may have occurred around the same time, but in the absence of a very clear mechanism tying the correlation, tying the, the kind of the proximal kill mechanism to the ultimate one, we can't be sure that that correlation means that there is a causative relationship. I hope that makes sense. Um, if not, you're very welcome to either ask me in person or drop me an email. Um, but I do want you to remember this in everything that you do, because if you're working in the scientific world, it's a really important lesson for us to learn that correlation does not imply causation. Even if two things are correlated, unless you can find the mechanism between the two, then there could be a third thing that's causing the change in both of those things. So please do your best to remember this as you go forward into your careers, because it's a really important lesson. And on that note, I'll video, I'll video you. I'll see you in video number three, where we, we will be looking in a bit more depth of patterns of extinction. See you there.